When Europeans invaded the area now encompassed by New York and New England, they found a diversity of indigenous nations organized into complex and shifting alliances and connected across vast differences by enduring trade routes. That Europeans, in the case of this territory, the British and the Dutch, saw these civilizations as fundamentally inferior, and the land and its resources as theirs for the taking, is of course by now well established. But in their early years, these extractive colonial economies, organized by private corporations to send wealth back to the metropole, required that Europeans forge alliances and trade relationships with the nations that they were soon to destroy, enslave, and immiserate. Part of the challenge is that, while Europeans brought many desirable goods that indigenous people could not manufacture, including guns, metal pots and knives, and rare decorative objects, the Europeans were ill at ease with indigenous trading customs, which were generally based less on mutual competitive acquisitiveness and more on custom, on hospitality, on reciprocity, and on social complexity. While different indigenous cultures had diverse ideas about what we would call ownership, they did not easily map onto Europeans' obsession with exclusivist private property, especially in matters of land. To say that these cultural differences led to conflict would be a half-truth. More accurate to say that the conflicts that naturally arise in any intercultural zone were taken by the Europeans as a pretext for war, for murder, and for punishment. A fine example is the European discovery of wampum, small purple and white shell beads used by indigenous people of the region for a wide variety of purposes, not limited to spiritual and secular regalia, trophy for victors of sports and games of chance, marriage and funerary rites, and specific kinds of trade and exchanges. Importantly, when strung together, wampum served as a common mnemonic device for recording history and treaties. Wampum was particularly prized because of its scarcity. The shells could only be harvested at certain times of the year and on certain beaches controlled by specific nations who painstakingly refined the shells into beads before trading them inland. Wampum's use as a diplomatic and pacific technology is emblematized in the vital importance of it to the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace, the constitution of the then five, now six nation confederacy, which many today argue is governed by the oldest surviving democratic constitution in the world. The story of the confederacy's origins, sometime in the 1300s, is tied to the use of wampum to subdue and heal a monstrous necromancer whose spirit had been captured by revenge and to bring into alliance the leaders of five nations ruined by vengeful warfare with one another. Though the Haudenosaunee home territories are hundreds of kilometers inland from the coastal nations that harvested and manufactured wampum beads, the two were frequently at war, in fact, wampum became a vital part of Haudenosaunee civilization. The exchange of wampum was a crucial part of many diplomatic, political, and spiritual processes. As numerous Haudenosaunee thinkers and anthropologists today note, wampum was and is particularly important in its capacity to give gravity to spoken words. Many solemn oath takings for, from marriage to treaty making, from the retelling of history to the sharing of stories, involved the exchange of wampum. It also has medicinal properties, such as the ability to cure grief and to stave off vengefulness, and it was used to pay ransoms and blood debts. As David Graeber notes, in spite of the fact that the Haudenosaunee were well known as ambitious and fearsome warriors, wampum was ultimately a creative technology for the production and reproduction of peace, a means through which individual and collective social creativity and innovation could be expressed in the interests of maintaining relations within the Confederacy and beyond it. I want to stress the importance of wampum as a flexible social technology, one of whose key functions was the transmutation of vengeance into social accord. Wampum's ameliorative and healing functions were, in a strange way, its downfall. As noted, it was frequently used as a means to pay a ransom for a warrior captured in battle. It was to this end that in 1622, in the early period of European colonization, the Pequod people near what is today Hartford, Connecticut, offered a French trader working for the Dutch West India Company named Jacques Elikens some 140 fathoms of wampum for the return of their chief, Tabotem, whom Elikens had captured while the former visited on matters of trade. Elikens was furious with Tabotem that the Pequod would not supply him with the sufficient animal furs 
that the trader could use to satisfy his corporate master's quotas in Holland, and so took Tabotemis as hostage to compel the Pequod people to be more forthcoming. Now, 140 fathoms of wampum represented almost 10,000 beads, each of which was painstakingly manufactured using stone and bone tools and traded to the Pequod, presumably for items of equivalent scarcity and value. In other words, this was a kingly ransom indeed. But at the time, the Dutch cared little for wampum, which they saw as a fetishistically hoarded trinket, idiotically beloved by people they saw as fundamentally inferior to themselves. Eelkens, enraged, returned only Tabotem's head to his people. This initial act of revenge is the grim origin of wampum's use as currency in New England and New Holland, and indeed it would be used so widely and European gold and silver currencies were so scarce in this period that wampum became legal tender in both col colonies well into the 17th century, as well as the main trade commodity of the fur trade. Ilkin's revenge against Tabotem and the Pequot for failing to deliver to him what he believed he was entitled, which he then claimed was justice, is a quintessential example of what I am calling revenge from above, which I explore in my forthcoming book, Revenge Capitalism. Today I want to present you with some of the stories from one of the chapters of that book, titled Money as a Medium of Vengeance. In it, I seek to counter the common neoliberal story that would suggest that money, and especially today's capitalist forms of money, are technologies of peace and the fruit of a long evolution of social and democratic development. Instead, I suggest that throughout capitalist history, especially beginning with its history in colonialism. Money has served as a weapon of class vengeance, and we must understand that there have been throughout that history proletarian efforts to reinvent, hack, or undermine and sabotage money as a means of resistance. To return to the early 1600s, Ilkins turned his so-called primitive accumulation of a king's ransom of wampum beads into the means to leverage more furs from the Pequod and other nations in the sphere of what Kesu Park calls the contact economy. As colonial brutality and disease took their deadly toll on indigenous nations in the subsequent century, and as European conquests seized more and more coastal lands, already existing and newly emerging rivalries deepened among and between indigenous nations, who were increasingly made to compete to harvest a dwindling supply of furs in order to secure European imports, including guns and ammunition, dry goods, and of course liquor. The latter was intentionally used by European traders, it was often traded at a loss or given away for free, as a means to produce favorable trading conditions, in spite of explicit warnings from European missionaries that addiction was ravaging indigenous communities. In this context, the European traders in both the Dutch and the English colonies were able to insist that wampum become the main and in some cases exclusive currency of the fur trade which was especially convenient because as the century unfolded, they controlled more and more of the coastal territories where wampum shells were collected. Throughout the latter 17th and early 18th century, wampum was essentially weaponized as a means to compel and to cheapen indigenous labor and to extract resources from the interior of the continent, with colonists controlling the wampum supply. Indeed, Europeans commissioned indigenous people and early settlers to manufacture wampum not only with newer European techniques and tools, but now out of conch shells that were imported from their Caribbean colonies. There is evidence that the colonists began to forge and counterfeit wampum from glass or ceramics. Much of this was undertaken in an entrepreneurial fashion, frequently by working-class colonists, so much so that both the Dutch and the British colonies at various times had to pass laws regulating the quality of the bead to prevent rampant inflation from the increased supply. As European power and influence grew in the region, the commoditization of wampum spread inland, as did competition between indigenous nations for furs. With the seizure of more and more indigenous lands and the forms of social and ecological destruction that colonialism unleashed, indigenous nations became increasingly dependent on imported European goods. Wampum, which was once a technology of peace and diplomacy, became a technology for a kind of systemic, decentralized vengeance of the nascent system of colonialism and capitalism. <laughs> 
By the 18th century, colonial power was such that it was possible for the administrators in Holland and England to demand tribute or taxation from indigenous nations in the form of wampum. The colonists also declared the right to try indigenous people in their courts and fine them according to their criteria, fines payable in wampum. Traditional wampum regalia handed down over generations had to be broken up for the beads to pay these fines, and so too were the belts and strings of wampum destroyed that told the story of centuries of indigenous history and diplomacy. I want to argue that we can trace today's enthusiasm for notions of so-called financial inclusion to acts like these, where subordinated and racialized populations were brought into the capitalist economy under circumstances of heinous violence and incredible exploitation. In the case of the wampum economy, this act of so-called financial inclusion, by which indigenous people were brought into the capitalist economy under terms that essentially destroyed their ability to thrive independently, is revealing, not only in its own right, but because arguably this story is at the origin of two quintessential American institutions, which today have been globalized. Jessica Catalino argues that the imagined figure of the pre-monetary and economically immature so-called New World Indian was central to the philosophical understandings of money, economics, and commerce of many of the most influential Western philosophers of the modern period, notably John Locke, whose influence on Adam Smith and other seminal political economists is difficult to underestimate. The false notion that indigenous people were primitive and pre-economic not only served to then exclude them from the capitalist economy built on their stolen lands and with their stolen labor, it also created a romantic myth of a kind of universal prehistory and progress against which modern forms and European forms of political economy were able to define themselves in contrast. Legal historian and theorist K. Su Park argues that the notion of alienable land and the practice of foreclosing on housing in revenge for non-payment of loans was pioneered in the seizure of indigenous lands through the wampum economy, as were the modern practices of extortionate debt. Furthermore, the idea that land could become a liquid asset, which stemmed from these practices, was crucial to the ability of the nascent American colony and later the American nation to develop its particularly now globalized legal economic framework for private property. In other words, it's not only that America was built on stolen indigenous land, it's also that the method of that land's theft of its commodification and financialization became the legal and economic foundation for the evolution of American capitalism. In a similar vein, literary and cultural historian Mark Schell has an argument about the origins of American money, and he traces the way that this early form of colonial currency, even after it was discontinued as legal tender, had a strong influence on particularly American history of financial innovation. The experience of trading in wampum allowed early American colonists to recognize that the value of money is built on relationships, on trust, and on diplomacy, rather than on the allegedly inherent value of the underlying metal, such as gold and silver. And this enabled many of the innovations with paper money and credit money that in fact financed the American Revolution. Later, the recurrence of the metaphor of wampum for money, which is still widely used in some parts of the United States, and the appearance of wampum and indigenous people on American money indicates an enduring legacy. In this sense, the ghost of wampum and of the colonial violence to which it bore witness haunts modern money to this day. This kind of haunting stands in stark contrast to the rather triumphalist narratives that most neoliberal thinkers offer when asked about the history of money. As I'll discuss in a moment, the common narrative is to suggest that money evolves naturally from humans' capacity to trade and barter, and that the evolution of money into more and more complex forms enables more and more complex social forms to originate. This progressivist narrative has the effect of normalizing and rationalizing colonialism and capitalism as natural expressions of the human impetus to trade and to exchange. It frames money as a neutral technology that we use simply to expedite our social commerce. 
But in this presentation, I want to turn to some examples of practices whereby oppressed and exploited people have taken a small kind of revenge on money, who have refused the dominant narrative of money as a technology of peace. From these, I think we can learn something about what financial innovation and financial inclusion might look like, not from the perspective of capitalists and the powerful, but from the perspective of the oppressed, the exploited, and the colonized. In the time that remains, I'm going to present three examples of what I call proletarian money hacking, or the arts of monetary resistance, that resonate with what James C. Scott calls the hidden transcript of power. For Scott, arguments about the cultural hegemony that the powerful wield usually rely on the testimonies, observations, and records of the powerful, which are oblivious to the actual thoughts, sentiments, and practices of the oppressed. These accounts tend to vastly overstate the acquiescence of oppressed people, whereas in actuality, the relationship is typically marked by the proliferation of so-called infrapolitical act arts of resistance. These infrapolitical arts of resistance can include tactical laziness, performative stupidity, parodic obsequiousness, sly jokes, encrypted stories of resistance, and other cultural and material practices which are subtle enough to evade detection and punishment from the oppressors and their enforcers, but at the same time meaningful enough to build solidarity among the oppressed. Scott encourages us to think of the hidden transcript of these arts of resistance if we are truly to understand social struggle, in part because all at once these seemingly insignificant puffs of wind can drum up a revolutionary storm which appears to come out of nowhere. I'm going to present three almost mythical moments in the history of capitalism and colonialism where we witness proletarian and oppressed people invent different methods of engaging with money outside of the normal mechanisms. And through that, I believe, we can recognize a hidden history of resistance and the arts of resistance that have animated the imagination towards money that otherwise we could very easily miss. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, it was very common for rulers of European colonial powers to game the value of their currency, which is to say, while the face value of a coin might be one pound of silver, there would not in fact be the equivalent of one pound of silver in that coin. This in fact has become so commonplace today that we hardly even remark upon it. However, in the 18th and 19th century, when most people's savings, especially working people's savings, were stored entirely in the coins that they might be able to obtain, this had a major impact. But it also led to opportunities for working class people to use money which had been devalued, which was no longer worth quite what it once was, as a canvas for creative and critical expression. One example of these is the so-called convict love token, which came to prominence in the late 1700s and through the 1800s. These were coins that were carved by those who had been convicted of petty crimes and sentenced to a variety of punishments, including transportation to colonies where they would become indentured servants and be auctioned off as workers. Most such convicts would be incarcerated in decrepit jails or on hulks, which is to say overcrowded ships that were set to ferry them to Australia or other British colonies. Were they fortunate enough to survive their incarceration and voyage, these proletarians, most of whom had been convicted of petty crimes by uncompassionate and hasty judges, would typically land and be auctioned to local farmers, capitalists, and public officials as indentured servants. They were violently transmuted into the cannon fodder for the expansion of the British Empire. Many of the female conflicts were essentially made into state-sanctioned sexual slaves. In the unlikely event of surviving their brutal sentence, some were permitted to buy passage back to England, but most could not or did not. While incarcerated in Britain, some prisoners carved or commissioned the carving of a love token as a keepsake for a loved one from whom they were soon to be separated, probably forever, a lover, a parent, a sibling, or a friend. These mementos were evidence of their existence in relationship to one another. As in the present, most of the acts for which proletarians were convicted were crimes of poverty and desperation, theft, prostitution, insubordination, vagrancy, and, very importantly, forgery and counterfeiting money. While the 18th and 19th centuries are remembered for the economic growth and power of the British Empire, these massive technological and economic transformations typically hit the working class as disasters. New manufacturing methods could throw hundreds of thousands of workers into the street at a time. 
The constant political squabbles between different elite factions led to the passing of trade and sumptuary laws that would cause commodities that were common one day to become scarce the next and vice versa, triggering massive shifts of wealth at the top of society and shifts in life and death at the bottom. In his book The London Hanged, radical historian Peter Leinbau makes clear that for elites throughout the 18th and 19th century in England, economics was not, as their myths would have it, a benign and neutral affair. On the contrary, it was a system enforced by authoritarian power. There was a close friendship, for instance, between John Locke and Isaac Newton, remembered today as heroes of philosophy and science respectively, and their relationship was forged in their joint management of the nascent capitalist economy. Locke in the realm of policy, and Newton as an early but formative governor of the Bank of England. Both agreed that no punishment was too severe for proletarians who dared to defy the state's control over the money supply, and they therefore helped pass a bevy of laws that criminalized the slightest economic infraction. George Kefensis has detailed the lengths to which the British government went to enforce what it considered to be the proper use of money, to prevent coin clipping, which is to say the shaving off of the edge of a coin to garner the precious metal, and counterfeiting. Leinbau argues that so many were the crimes that were punishable by death that were associated with the misuse of money at that time that we should understand the period as a thanatocracy, the rule of death. George Cruikshank's Bank Restriction Note, a satirical print from 1819, comments on the horrors unleashed on proletarians found guilty not simply for creating counterfeit or forged currency, but even for handling it accidentally. But who could blame those counterfeiters? The Bank of England notes of the day were laughably easy to imitate, and for those starving on the streets of the world's wealthiest cities, the temptation to take into their own hands the seemingly magical power of the governor of the bank to sign wealth into existence with a stroke of a pen must have been irresistible. It is difficult to read Leinbau's account of the legal and punitive regimes of early English capitalism without being enraged by the petty vindictiveness of the regime. First, it made proletarian lives practically unlivable through the legalized seizure of lands and the repression of struggles for better living conditions. Then, to add insult to injury, it criminalized a huge swath of survival activities and rendered up the victims to the hangmen to serve as grim examples for their peers. While the punishment for such infractions against the crown was nominally death, most convicts had their sentences commuted to transportation. As cheap as it was for British elites to make gruesome public spectacles of the execution of proletarians, it was still more profitable to consign them to indenture and transport them to the colonies to be sold. The ocean, disease, overwork, or simply heartbreak would likely do the work of the executioner anyway. It would not be an exaggeration to say that most judges and lawmakers in England at the time were enthusiastic investors in colonial expeditions, both financial investors and ideological investors, and the colonies demanded cheap labor. The desperate, traumatized, and deracinated survivors would become shock troops of settler colonialism, with all the horrific violence that that process entailed. The means and ends of the whole gory enterprise were capitalist forms of money. So convict love tokens represented proletarians taking that money back into their own hands and radically transforming it into a medium for their own tragic solidarity, a tiny rebellion or tiny revenge against the very medium of their immiseration. An artisan of such tokens would painstakingly efface the image of the king or other royal symbolism, the very nexus of state and capitalist sovereignties, to create a smooth surface. Less sophisticated, cheaper makers would create words or even crude images by punching dozens of small holes in the coin. More skilled artists carved into the surface of the coin itself. The ghost-like messages are often simply a name and a date. Sometimes there is also a description of a crime for which the carver or the commissioner of the carving had been convicted. Other times the tokens directly address a loved one, begging them not to forget. Occasionally, startlingly intricate designs appear. This story reveals a proletarian view of money as a weapon wielded against a common life. There is no utopianism here, just rancor, terror, and revenge. From the bottom-up perspective, and despite its alluring nature, money is not and never can be a medium of social and economic innovation. It is a curse, a trap, and a poison.
The physical effacement of coins is a desperate antagonism to a capitalism that renders the proletarian body a worthless machine to be exploited and disposed of. To simply carve one's name on the king's coins is a human rebellion against an inhuman system. In this sense, the proletarian financial innovation reclaimed from the sovereign, in a small micro-political way, the right to revenge. In Western ruling class political thought, that of Hobbes, of Locke, of Rousseau, sovereignty allegedly arises to monopolize revenge and prevent society from succumbing to endless and escalating cycles of retribution. The sovereign insists on their right to adjudicate claims to harm in society and to undertake vengeance against wrongdoers, not for an infraction against this or that wronged person, but for an infraction against the common peace. That common peace is likewise represented in the image of the sovereign on the coin, the medium of peaceful, mutually advantageous trade, trade which relies on laws to enforce contracts and prevent theft. The acts of the proletarian coin carvers were a kind of inchoate refusal of the whole narrative emblematized in the sovereign stamped coin. That coin, in my argument, signifies not law and justice and fairness and equality, but the revenge of the powerful upon those whom they oppress and exploit. By transforming coins into a medium of relationality, proletarian artists reverse engineered capitalist alienation of their labor power. For Marx, money is the ultimate manifestation of the commodity form. Capitalism transforms us thinking, feeling, rational human beings into mere sellers of a standardized commodity, our abstract labor power, for which we earn a wage, with which we buy back the products of our collective labor power in the form of commodities. Money both orchestrates and intermediates this process. But in a sense, money also represents this process as a whole. Money is the hieroglyph of alienation. Marx wrote that money is the false bond with the rest of society one carries around in one's pocket. What I have elsewhere proposed is a holographic shard of a larger totality, containing an uncanny glimpse of the whole in the fragment. This whole is what the working classes produce, but which is stolen from them and alienated from them. By transforming money into a form of social intercourse, of human relationality, of pathos, and of proletarian poetry, the convict love tokens I'm exploring here refuse the mystification of society in money and the violence that that mystification normalizes. Instead, they reiterate the work of sociality, of social reproduction, that is locked or encrypted in money. Hobo nickels were crafted by itinerant Americans forced into a life of vagrancy in the aftermath of the First World War, when millions of decommissioned soldiers, many of them physically and psychologically wounded, and their families were essentially abandoned by the state, and later during the Great Depression. From 1913 to 1938, the United States Mint produced a distinctive Indian head or buffalo five cent piece, so named for the relief image on the obverse and reverse respectively, which became a favorite canvas for carvers. Both the image of the man, a fictionalized amalgam of many different indigenous people and cultures, and of the buffalo were larger than most similar depictions on other coins, and the copper alloy from which the coin was minted presented a relatively pliable material if one had minimal tools. While proletarians almost immediately began to hack the coins to create love tokens and similar artifacts, the heyday of the hobo nickel came in the 1930s, when an increasing number of proletarians were forced to abandon their homes and ride the rails in search of food, shelter, and work amidst wholesale economic collapse. The carved nickel often showed portraits of the carver or his commissioner, we do not know of any female carvers, though we do know of female hobos, by means of altering the Indian head on the obverse, while the buffalo on the reverse became a boxcar, a horse, a turtle, or a hobo with an iconic pack on his back. Hobo nickels appear to have served many purposes, though much is unfortunately lost to history. There appears to be evidence that through their artistry, hobos increased the coin's exchange value, selling them or bartering them for goods or services, including food and shelter, that would cost more than the effaced value of the five-cent coin. 
There are reports of hobo nickels being given as gifts in return for a mundane kindness, such as a farmer letting a hobo sleep in his barn, or a woman giving a hobo a meal, regardless of their estimated value. There are also rumors that the nickels were tokens of solidarity among hobos, a unique calling card and means of communication passed from one to another as their bearers made their way back and forth across the nation. And however doubtful they may seem, there are even rumors that hobos added coded messages to these tokens, as they were known to mark buildings and other infrastructure with sigils to warn or encourage future travelers. The identities and biographies of only a handful of original hobo nickel creators are known, notably George Washington Bo Hughes, who lived an itinerant life from the time he left home at age 15 in roughly 1915 until the time of his disappearance in the early 1980s. The son of formerly enslaved parents, Bo's craft was taught to him by another famous carver, Bertram or Bert Vigand. While Hughes created nickels until the time of his disappearance, his most sought-after work was carved in the early phase of his career. Frequent beatings by railway police, as well as having to endure frigid winter nights in meager shelters or on trains, left his hands in a near-ruined state. This was compounded by a carving accident in 1957, which, in his last decades, left him unable to do more than merely punch out crude diagrams on coins, rather than carving images. The hobo nickel gives us a glimpse into a proletarian practice of secretly avenging the crimes and cruelties of a system of capitalist monetary privation and exploitation. Here the medium of money itself becomes an opportunity to craft a whole new infra-economy, wherein these tokens come to express, communicate, and reproduce the very different set of non-market values and relationships. We know so little of the use and transit of hobo nickels, except as collector's items and numismatic curiosities, that we cannot know the rules of the game the hobos played, but at least two things seem clear. The first is that the hobos were obviously not seeking to build an alternative market economy, and they seem to have no ambition to challenge or replace the existing capitalist state money system either. Second, if there were rules to the economic game of the hobo nickel, these rules were evidently extremely flexible. Was it a gift economy or a barter economy? Was the hobo nickel a commodity or a sacrament, a joke or a coded message? Perhaps none of these or perhaps all. What seems evident at the very least is that the hobo nickel was a medium of solidarity, joy, and creativity at the margins of the capitalist economy, among those that economy rendered surplus and disposable. Drawing on Scott's discussion of the hidden transcript and the arts of resistance of the oppressed, I would propose that the proletarian currency disruptions and hacks presented in this talk might be understood as part of a hidden ledger. Miranda Joseph has illustrated the importance of forms of counter-accounting to movements for economic and collective liberation. We must find ways to account differently for value and who and what is valuable. These examples I'm exploring here represent some entries in a forgotten, ignored, or suppressed history of attempts to express value otherwise using the very medium of subjugation, which is to say money. Collectively, this hidden ledger would challenge our unfounded optimism in top-down monetary innovations, and they would also echo the haunting revelation of Walter Benjamin that, in his words, there is a secret agreement between past generations and the present one. Our coming was expected on earth. Like every generation that preceded us, we have been endowed with a weak messianic power, a power to which the past has a claim. That claim cannot be settled cheaply. It is said that in October 1923, at a moment of almost complete economic catastrophe in Germany, an iceberg made its way from the North Pole through the straits between the North and Baltic Seas to arrive at the nation's port of Lübeck, a one-time Hanseatic capital. Appearing as though through a portal from another pure, cold world, this strange and barren visitor came at a moment when society had all but collapsed due to the vindictive reparations Germany was made to pay in the wake of the First World War. Inflation in the country had become so severe that people had to take wheelbarrows full of bills to stores to buy the most basic commodities. Government issued notes, even in denominations of billions of marks, were quickly deemed worthless. The wealthy sought to remove as much gold and foreign hard currency from the country as possible, as the state mandated its right to raid personal deposits at private banks to pay its foreign debts. 
This was an economic catastrophe that made a grim and deadly pantomime of the typical uncertainties of capitalist prices and money supplies. As a result, municipalities like the city of Lübeck began to issue their own cheaply manufactured, mass-printed Notgeld, emergency money intended for temporary use to enable commerce and taxation in the absence of any useful legal tender. Throughout the heyday of Notgeld from 1921 to 1923, hundreds of thousands of different, often extremely creative and colorful notes were produced, sometimes for use as functional if unreliable currency, often, and increasingly after 1923 when their use as money was banned by the national government, as a collector's item, as a way for the local municipality to raise funds. Because it offered so many artists and citizens an opportunity to mint their own money with their own chosen symbolism, expressing their own individual and collective values, Notgeld became a particularly vivid social canvas. In the present day, artist duo Kahn and Selesnik offer a parafictional depiction of the fabled 1923 event when the rogue iceberg became lodged in Lübeck's harbor for about a month, during which time the municipality, in what must be a somewhat tongue-in-cheek move, declared sovereignty over it, naming it the Iceberg Freistadt, or Iceberg City Free State, a strange, barren, and rapidly melting temporary autonomous zone. The artists present a range of beguiling historical documents that indicate that, until it finally split and its remnants were washed back out to sea in November, citizens not only visited the iceberg out of curiosity, they also appear to have increasingly used it as a literal and metaphorical platform to imagine new relationships and a new political and economic order. It could almost have been a spectacle orchestrated by the contemporary surrealists, a public dream amidst a common nightmare. And indeed, Kahn and Selesnik offer that the Iceberg Freistadt was commemorated on several Notgeld notes. These exhibited a rare aesthetic exuberance and imaginative panache during a time when many were starving amidst literal piles of money, when money was in fact being burned for warmth and desperately sewn into clothing for insulation. Some of this Notgeld appears to have been issued by the Iceberg Freistadt itself, a conjectural, melting free state, minting its own currency through the power of imagination alone. Eighty-five years later, amidst the financial crisis of 2008, Kahn and Selesnik created, assembled, and organized materials related to the mythical Iceberg Freistadt incident in their immersive exhibition. Replicas of the original Notgeld pour out of a suitcase, are stacked neatly in a wheelbarrow, are stitched together into garments distributed around the exhibition. Meanwhile, bills appear in panoramic paintings, in staged and archival photographs, in vitrines and affixed to the walls. A huge replica of one of the bills hangs face up from a pulley on the gallery's ceiling, counterbalanced on the other end of the rope by stacks of flat rocks. Paper birds and airplanes made of Notgeld flock about the gallery suspended by a thread. A house of cards made of bundles of Notgeld sits ominously on a plinth. Much could be said about the Iceberg Freistadt, both in terms of its moment in history as well as Kahn and Selesnik's contemporary exhibition. The artists operate at the fraught threshold of fact and fiction to generate the radical imagination. I am less interested in the events that actually occurred than in what the myth might make imaginable. My interests stem from the way they seem to gesture towards an alternative horizon for money if we were to reject a genealogy of top-down money intervention and engineering and instead paid attention to the ways in which the poor and the exploited and the colonized have appropriated money as sly resistance. What does it mean to create a currency for a temporary autonomous zone? From the perspective of almost any mainstream or even heterodox economic school of thought, it is a futile or purely aesthetic exercise. The zone doesn't need money, it can't sustain an economy, and it will imminently melt back into the ocean. And yet, what was perhaps revealed in the Iceberg Freistadt episode and exhibition is that, when money is detached from functionality and from the dreams of their economic architects, when money is allowed to become part of an economy of creative social improvisation, money can become a medium of collective joy and a kind of proletarian minor utopianism. The Iceberg Freistadt Notgeld, if it really existed in fact, or if it exists purely as a fiction, was, and in a way still is, essentially a public plaything 
a shared resource for a virtuosity of the commons where, even amidst some of the darkest, most chaotic moments of people's lives, a shared wonder emerged from the fabric of the cooperative human imagination. This is a reflection of what Cornelius Castoriadis calls the tectonic magma of the radical imagination, that substance of destructive and creative potential out of which all social formations, institutions, and orders are congealed, but that also periodically sweeps away those remnants. There have, of course, been intentionally radical artistic appropriations of money for political purposes. At the turn of the century, suffragettes famously carved votes for women on British shillings as part of an escalating repertoire of direct actions to win the vote. In the 1970s, Brazilian artist Sildo Morales stamped banknotes with subversive me messages and passed them back into circulation to avoid censors and repression by the reigning fascist military junta. More recently, American artist Joseph Delape created and distributed rubber stamps that imprint money with silhouettes of predator drones, of people with their hands up, and of ocean waves to draw attention to America's extrajudicial drone assassination program, the movement for black lives, and climate change, respectively. These are all noteworthy examples, but I'd like to conclude on a more ambiguous note. The proletarian money hacks and currency disruptions explored in this talk are typically categorized by collectors and scholars as exonumia, money-like objects that do not function as money, a curious and imminently deconstructible concept. Exo derives from ancient Greek prefix for out, often used to refer to the outside or to the alien. Numia refers to money by way of a reference to customary practices, a root that also gives us the legal, political, and ph philosophical notion of nomos, or law. So in a sense, an encrypted meaning of exonumia is that which is outside of customary laws. Similarly, we can interpret these practices that I have explored here as ones that exist and persist outside, or maybe more accurately within, against, and beyond the laws, the customs, and the practices of the conventional, exploitative, and unequal capitalist economy. We might understand these as some of the currencies of the undercommons, as Fred Moten and Stefano Harney frame them, those quotidian and everyday practices of proletarian and black planning, of pragmatic yet imaginative solidarity. Ironically, the capitalist economy depends on the bedrock of decommodified social care that the undercommons represent, but which also it strives to contain, control, delimit, criminalize, and rent back to us. In this sense, exonumia is the money of the internalized alien, or the money of the alienated. For Marx, money represents the method, the lifeblood, and the culmination of a system of capitalism that alienates us from our species being, from our cooperative and our imaginative potential to work together. These exonumismatic practices that I have been speaking of represent a kind of revenge of the alienated in a small and revealing way. It is the specter of our own cooperative and creative potential, today encrypted within money, come back to avenge itself. Scores of convict ships were lost at sea on their way to the colonies, many of them to mutiny of the imprisoned. Many hobos, including George Washington Bo Hughes, disappeared without a trace. It is rumored that, when the iceberg Freistadt drifted back out to sea, there were a number of people who had made the barren, melting chunk of ice their home, presumably preferring its topographical austerity to the unnecessary, all-too-human austerity of post-war Lübeck, and that not all were accounted for after most were rescued. Imagine now a parallel universe where all these exiles from the history of capitalist accumulation met. What currency would they have invented together, these convicts, hobos, and debtors? And what can we adapt from their mythological past?